Galatians chapter 5, reading again from verse 19 through 21. I'm going to bring the four-week series on the works of the flesh to a conclusion this evening. Now, I have an, one entire sermon on that, but I wanted to spend more time on it in this series. We're coming to our eighth message in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to title this Selfish Sins. We've been looking at sexual sins and spiritual sins and social sins. Tonight, Selfish Sins, or we could title it Corrupt Indulgence. Beginning in verse 19, he said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, again tonight we ask your blessings upon the reading of thy precious word. And Lord, we pray again tonight as we look at the works of the flesh, Lord, for thy leading and thy guidance. And Lord, help us to believe the scripture that we read tonight and that we apply them to our lives. For it's in Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Again, we're going to be looking at selfish sins, uh, corrupt indulgence. And what we're doing is that we're taking the last uh, uh, two sins that are mentioned in verse 21. And he mentions here drunkenness and revelings. And I want you to notice that as we get into this subject tonight, please remember that he says in the latter part of verse 21, and we would find this, in other places in the Scripture, such as um, Corinthians and Colossians and Ephesians, and even in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, that those who do such things, he says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, those who practice these things, that it is their lifestyle, they habitually continue in them, he clearly says in this passage that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are sobering words as we look at them. Now, as we come here this evening, I'm going to remind you in verses 16 through 18 that he contrasts walking in the Spirit with walking in the flesh. That's verse 16, 17, and verse 18, we're commanded in the passage to walk in the Spirit. And again, in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if we are saved and have the Spirit of God in us, he said, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so we see clearly that to walk in the Spirit, or to be filled with the Spirit, or to be led of the Spirit, is clearly a command in Scripture. To walk in the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. Now, let me take these two words, drunkenness and revelings, and these, and as we look at these, especially drunkenness, I want to speak this evening, again, focusing in on drunkenness or the abuse of wine, I want to preach this in a negative way and show its consequences. Now, in the past, uh, and I wrote these down so I would not forget them. Of course, in the past, in 2004, that's been a while back, I wrote an article titled, Wine. Now, I just titled it Wine. I subtitled it Drunkenness. And when we talk about wine, we're talking about, we're, I'm including mixed wine, mixed drinks, strong drink, or anything else that can apply. So we're using the word wine this evening as a broad term. But I wrote this article, I preached on it then. Uh, also in 2010, 
which has been nine years ago, I preached a message titled Wine. And then in 2017, this was for the radio, I preached a message on drunkenness. And then in other sermons, we have touched on this and spent time on it. So we have covered this uh, in the church here a number of times. What I want to do this evening, again, is mainly focus in on drunkenness. Now, when I preached on the subject of wine in 2010, I basically looked, and this will sound like a contradiction probably, but I basically uh, looked at the positive aspect of it and the negative. We're only going to focus tonight, well, mainly on the negative. And drunkenness. When, and I don't debate with some people over this issue as to whether you can drink or not drink because in the scripture, and I dealt with this again, if you want to go back and listen to the sermon just titled Wine nine years ago, first of all, I dealt with the positive side of it and I took passages like Psalms 104, verse 14 and 15. And in John chapter 2 and verse 1 through 11, and also Matthew 9 and verse 11, and I took many other scriptures on the positive aspect, and and it is shown in scripture, wine, the word itself, is used as a symbol of joy, a staple of life. It's used in religious services such as offerings. It was associated with festivals, the tithe, the temple. Uh, It is a symbol of salvation and wisdom the kingdom of God, and also has healing qualities, as in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. I did that, and then the second point in that sermon, I dealt with the negative side of it, as we will do here tonight. Now, why why did I do that? Well, you do see the word wine used in the Scripture, as in Psalms 104, in a positive way. He he mentions the bread that is for the heart, the oil that make the face to shine, and the wine, uh, you know, that brings joy. Now, we're talking tonight about drunkenness, which is absolutely a sin according to Holy Scripture. And in the right context, wine is not mentioned as sin. In the wrong context, wine is definitely mentioned many, many times as sin. I, uh, I have tried to study the Hebrew words, there's several, and the Greek words, and, and, uh, and people will argue this saying back and forth. I can give you many reasons why you shouldn't touch it, but I cannot tell you verbatim that you cannot touch it. Does that make sense? And I'm not going to I'm not going to try to twist or play around with the scriptures and that's the reason that I come to the conclusion that I have. Now again, I do not drink, I don't touch it. I have several reasons for that. One reason is as a Christian, I don't want to ever uh, take the chance of uh, becoming a drunk as I was at one time before I became a Christian. And there's other reasons as well. I have several reasons, and one of them as a preacher, I'm told not to touch it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then I don't want to be a stumbling block or a poor testimony to someone else. So I have several reasons why I do not drink at all. Now notice we have here drunkenness and revelings. We have the subject of drinking and eating before us here tonight. And first of all, I want you to notice that as we come to this, and let me just say this also, I have a message I've been preparing actually off and on for the last year. I'm, I want to preach a message just on drugs and really focus in on marijuana. And I, I may title the sermon, The Stoned Age, and, uh, and, and the, just the consequences of drugs. We see it in our society. We see it all around us. And notice I said the stoned age, not the stone age. And uh, it's a very dangerous uh, substance as well, and as well as wine or strong drink. Now, 
Notice with me as we read uh, in verse 21 again. And, he, and again, he mentions these two words. Uh, I'm just going to start with drunkenness, revelings, and, he's, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. A definition for drunkenness is intoxication. Now, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary says to be overwhelmed or overpowered by spiritus liquor. And then the definition of revelings, and I want you to turn with me and turn loose of Galatians and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. The definition of revelings is it would be a, a, a party attitude. That would be a short definition. But it has the ideal of carousing, wild parties, all sorts of excess and debauchery and dis, um, disorder, um, um, merry-making and frivolous behavior. I mean, there's a number of synonyms that you can put with that word. It would have to do with orgies. It would have to do with, again, these two words, revelings and drunkenness, are tied together here in Galatians and also in um, in, a, in the First Peter chapter 4. And I want you to turn there and we're going to read one verse from this chapter and we're going to go to Romans. When I think about here in our area, in Mobile, Alabama area, and I think about Mardi Gras, these two words come to my mind. Because basically it is a legalized drunk. It really is, and that, that's really what it's all about uh, once a year for about, I, I guess it lasts for three or four weeks. And there's many holidays. We've got a holiday coming up next week of Halloween. Well, again, a lot of drunkenness and, and, and parties and things are centered around that that are contrary to Scripture. Even in the Christmas season, there's lots of drunkenness and so forth. So when we look at these two words and we consider them, we can see it around us. It's all around us. Now, when we look at the subject of drunkenness, and I want to read another passage before I read in First Peter. You, when I give it to you, you can quote it, but I want to read it in reference to drunkenness alone. And that is in Ephesians 5.18. Most of you know what it says. It tells us, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Drunkenness is the devil's substitute for being filled with the Spirit. And as wine controls a person's behavior and attitude, their speech, their walk, and everything about them, we find that the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be spending three weeks just on the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to break those down into three uh, at a time. And uh, so we know that uh, when we are filled with the Spirit and we walk in the Spirit, that the Spirit controls our mind, it controls our heart, our walk, our speech, our attitude, our thinking. Well, wine does the opposite. So it is the devil's substitute for the Holy Spirit. And we find, according to Galatians, it is a work of the flesh. And drunkenness is not a disease, it is a sin. And if it was a disease, it'd be the first that'd be sold in a bottle and advertised as such. But it, it now it can create diseases, but it is not a disease. When we look into the Scripture, we find that drunkenness is condemned all through the Bible, there is much warning in both Testaments, old and new, and we find that uh, it, it is evil. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It is a mocker. It is the deceiver. And drinking or drunkenness is a curse. In other words, it brings judgment in the lives of individuals. And I have a lot of stats here. And you know what? I don't even update them anymore. The old ones are horrible enough. I've got some 20, I got some stats laying here 20 years old that I've used before. I said, why update these? Here's some that are uh, probably 15 years old. Here's some that are 10 years old. And then the article that we wrote, we've got some things in there as well. Well, notice with me as we come here to 1 Peter 
And I'm reading in chapter 4. Now, I approach this subject from two or three points of view. First of all, I want to approach every doctrine and every subject totally and completely from the Scripture and what God has said. And I come to the conclusion, period, that drunkenness is wicked. It's a sin, and, and, and God commands us not to be drunk with wine or anything else. And those that continue in that lifestyle clearly, in Galatians, 1 Corinthians 6, and other places, that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So those are sobering words. So that's, I come at it first from the Holy Scripture. But I'll also come at it secondly, and I let this be number two, because I want to base everything on the Bible and not just my background or experience. But I'll also come to this subject based, uh, secondly, on experience. Uh, I've had a lot of experience in this in, in just in early years of my life. I grew up around it. From the time I was uh, three, four, five years of age, I grew up around many drunks in, as far as our relatives and their friends and so forth. And so I've seen this firsthand. I've seen what it done to our family and to other families uh, of my relatives. I've seen how my grandmother was treated. She partially raised me and my brother. And so I grew up around this. At 10 years of age, I have, was beat in the face with fist of an uncle that was drunk and out of his mind. So I, so I know about this. I know about it. I know about having, uh, and, and this will sound so far out to some of you, but to have my grandmother to take me and my brother as seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, take us and hiding out at night and a uh, big part of the night because of uh, her sons and others, friends and whatever of them, uh, fighting and shooting up the house and things of that nature. That's what I was raised in. The sad part of it is, is that I didn't learn from that. The sad part of it is, started drinking at 10 until I was 19 when I came, was converted and uh and the sad part of it is, is that I started turning out just like those that I was raised around. I didn't know there was anything else to do. It led me to crime. It led me to going before the courts and the judges at early years, 15, 16, 17 years of age. It led me to jail sentences. Almost got sent off one time to a reform school. It led me to fights, gun fights, literally, and knife fights, and different types of crime. And so, by experience, secondly, I use the Scripture first, but by experience, I know how wicked this is. And my last week, before that I was converted, I actually pulled a gun on a policeman. And he would have probably killed me if he had not have known my father. And it was the week after that, May of 1972, that I became a Christian. And so, so I, I, I understand this subject clearly from the Scripture and also from experience. And when I preach in these rescue missions, we've got two we've been doing for about 25 years the, those that are recovering from uh, alcohol and drug addictions, they cannot play with me. I know this from Scripture, and I know this from experience, the horrors of this subject. Well, notice with me that as we come here, I'm reading in 1 Peter chapter 3 and ver- I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 3. And he said, For the time past of our life, He's talking about before we were converted. May suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. In other words, we had plenty of sin in our lives. And when we walked in lasciviousness, that word means excess, lust, notice excessive wine, there's our drunkenness, revelings, banqueting, and abominable idolatries. 
We find here in this text, again, excessive wine, revelings, and banqueting. Banquetings is simply wild parties, also things of that nature. In other words, we have uh, three or four words that would fit into this category. Notice with me as we come to Romans chapter 13. Now again, drunkenness is the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. To be intoxicated is to be controlled by what an individual drinks. Now, I'm coming to uh, Romans in chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Now, what I'm going to do tonight, since I've preached on this before and written on it, uh, I'm going to just give you some verses. We will not turn to everything uh, tonight. And notice as we come here to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 is uh, getting into the practical section of of the book. And I I want to pick up reading from verse 11 through verse 14. Notice here what he says. He tells us here in this passage, he said, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Now here's our word. Rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. There's a lot in this passage, but we find here clearly in verse 13 that we're not to walk in writing and drunkenness and chambering, that's shacking up, and wantonness, that's loose living. And uh, and writing in our passage is, again, to overdo anything, excess, as we've already seen that word a few times. We're not to be drunk with wine in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Let's take a few passages from the Old Testament. And if you're taking notes, write down Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 25. The first time that the word wine, and again, uh, The Bible mentions wine, new wine, strong drink, mixed wine. In other words, this is kind of a word that covers uh, 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 all of the concept of drinking. Today, there's, there's whiskey, there's wine coolers, there's everything under the sun uh, that you can get your hands on now. But in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 25, it's the first mention of wine. And you know the story that Noah had, uh, had uh, made wine and he was drunk. And you know the story. You know, one of his sons came in and saw his nakedness. Now, what is interesting is the first time that we find the word wine in the Bible we, there's, there's three or four things associated with it. We find that there is drunkenness, of course, which is a sin and a violation of Scripture. We find also there is nakedness. And we find also that there is a curse. You remember Ham's, you know, son. And there's a curse. And then also immodesty. Or, and I, and I used to always say immorality. I don't think there was anything physically done when his son came in. There's many teach that there's, you know, they add some things to the story. But, uh, you remember the other two sons came in backwards, you know, and covered him up. They never looked upon his nakedness. And that ought to teach us something. Uh, that ought to teach us something, is that uh, we are not to be immodest even in our own home with our children and our family and even around relatives and so forth. My wife and I knows a family uh, 
that uh, that they ran around uh, in their underwear, and uh, the parents and the children they ran around, you know, hardly anything on. And when you look into that family, they would even do this with other people visiting them. And uh, when you look into that family, there was a lot of immorality and a lot of things that came out of that. They just sat around and watched television and in their underwear. It didn't matter where's the children or the parents or, uh, you know, they're three quarters naked and whatever. And it had an effect upon that family. Well, we find the first time that wine is mentioned in the Scriptures, again, there's drunkenness and nakedness. And there's a curse. The second time we find wine mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter 19, uh, verses 30 through 38, we find immorality. We find that Lot, his two daughters that had escaped from Sodom, they were in a cave, that his two daughters got him drunk. Lot was two different nights, was in a drunken stupor and lay with his two daughters on those two nights. And you know the story of the children that was produced and the nations that come from them, Moab and Ammon. Well, we find immorality the second time that wine is mentioned. Drunkenness. So there is a great warning and a great danger that we have of this subject in, in the Scripture. And again, we have many references in this article. And some of these facts that I have, I'm not going to read very many of them. Some of them are 10, 15, and even high as 20 years of age. And I guess this one would be 10 years old, these stats. There were 10 million alcoholics in our country. Twenty million consume large amounts of alcohol. There's a great health risk in the U.S. from alcohol. One of the twelve, one out of twelve rather marriages fail because of alcohol. It reduces lifespan in many cases by ten years. There was a study done, I think it was in London, England, the British Medical Journal, in 2010, that alcohol is is the most harmful drug followed by crack and heroin. And alcohol, probably to this day, ranks most harmful among a list of about 20 drugs. We talk more about drugs today than we do alcohol. But alcohol is still one of the major contributors to uh, sorrow and woe that we find in our society. Uh, this study, they considered the physical, psychological, and social problems caused by drugs and alcohol. And let me back up, caused by drugs. And alcohol was the, at the top of the list. It's almost three times as harmful as cocaine and tobacco. I know that's hard to believe, but alcohol has been around for a long time. And, uh, and so, but anyway, um, Here's a quote that I gave ten years ago. In our country, drunkenness has killed more persons than all the wars of history put together. During the Vietnam War, 58,000 American soldiers were killed. During the same period, five times that number, 250,000 people, were killed in our country by automobile accidents caused by drunk drivers. And that's just insane to think about. That 10-year war, a little over 58,000 Americans died, and you have 250,000 are dead in alcohol-related accidents. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. When I would read those stats, I'd say that cannot be true. And every time I would check them with other sources, it was so And here's a list I had 20 years ago. Who knows what it is now? But alcohol is directly involved in 20% of all freezing deaths, 25% of all choking deaths, 36% of all pedestrian deaths, 50% of all deaths by falls, 
52% of all uh, fire deaths, 60% of all suicides. Of course, you could add drugs in this as well. 50% of all murders, 50% of all teenage motor vehicle deaths, 69% of all drownings, 76% of all recreational aircraft deaths, 50% of all motor vehicle injuries, 65% of all child abuse cases, 40% of all divorces, 50% of all fractures, 50% of all workplace problems, 50% of rapes, 65% of motorcycle crashes, 69% of recreational boating injuries, 72% of all assaults and robberies, 80% of all criminal court cases, 40% of fatal industrial accidents. Now, you, you think about this. You can take away between 50 to 80% of most problems in our society if you took away alcohol and drugs. And, of course, no community is exempt anymore from the alcohol and drugs. No community is exempt. It, it is everywhere across our land. I remember when drugs first came into our town in Dayton, Tennessee, when I was a teenager. I remember the first time that uh, that I saw marijuana, about 14 or 15 years of age. Well, notice in the book of Isaiah, I want to read a few passages here. And if you're taking notes tonight, Isaiah 28, verses 1 through 8. And in that text, we see clearly that many in Israel, ancient Israel of the Old Testament, had a problem with the drink. Uh, verse 1 mentions the drunkards of Ephraim and those who are, lo- uh, are overcome with wine. It mentions drunkards again in verse 3. And it mentions those who have erred through wine and strong drink uh, in verse 7 and in verse 8. So many places we see this. Isaiah 56, 12 also speaks of this. And these are just a few. So, so we find that drunkenness would bring judgment and a curse not only to individuals but to nations. Remember Nabal, uh, Abigail's husband in 1 Samuel 25, 36-38. Um, uh, David was about to take him out and Abigail went to talk to him. He's drunk. She waited till he sobered up, told him the story, and of course God took him out about ten days later. There's a king in 1 Kings chapter 16-6-9 through that he was killed while he was drunk. And there, I think it was another king, Ben-Hadad, that was killed while he was drunk in 1 Kings 20, verses 16 through 21. So we see many places in the Scripture where drunkenness brought much sorrow to the individual's lives. In Isaiah chapter 5, Reading verse 11, beginning there, he says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hand. We find wine and music, secular music, in verses 11 and in verse 12. We also find in this passage there's several woes throughout this chapter. And again, verse 11 is one of those. But notice in verse 22, he says here, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. And then we see the judgment of these in verse 24 and verse 25. Turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs in chapter 20. <clears throat> I handed out a sheet here one time, probably ten years ago, 
uh, and I think there's 70 references to wine just in that one sheet to drinking and strong drink and showing, giving warning. Notice with me as we come to Proverbs chapter 20. This subject is nothing to play around with. We find here in chapter 20 and verse 1, he says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. In other words, they're a fool. Any person that uh, allows himself to become drunken, they're basically a fool according to the Scripture. They're not wise. And I want you to notice that wine is a mocker and wine is a deceiver. Notice in Proverbs chapter 23. First of all, reading in verse 20. In verse 20. And by the way, in Psalm 75 and verse 8, wine is a symbol of judgment. In Jeremiah chapter 35, verses 5 through 14, remember, remember the Rechabites? For a few hundred years, they listened to Jonadab, uh, one of their uh, fathers, and they, uh, and they were told to abstain from wine. And when, when they had come into the city of Jerusalem and wine was set before them, they refused that. So there's many in the Scripture that we find that did not drink at all. John the Baptist was one. Daniel would not drink the king's wine in Daniel chapter 1. And he purposed in his heart in verse 8 that he would not do that. But notice here, we find in verse 20 and 21, Be not among wine bibbers, among righteous eaters of the flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So there's a warning here. And then we'll pick up a reading in verse 29. Now notice as we read from verse 29 to the end of this chapter, I want you to notice that what wine brings, drunkenness. And what we're going to read here, it brings woe, it brings sorrow, it brings pain and poverty and contention. It brings wounds, redness of eyes. It brings foolish speech. And it bites like a serpent. Now notice as we read this, verse 29. Who hath woe? That is, who hath trouble and sorrow? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? In other words, who's always in debates and arguments? Uh, who hath babbling? That is slurred speech and running their mouth when they don't need to be talking. Who hath wounds? In other words, they get hurt and don't even know what happened. Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? That is bloodshot eyes. Well, here it is. They that tarry long at the wine and they that go to seek mixed wine. That is any drink that's been mixed together to make it stronger or whatever. He said in verse 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Think about this. At last it bites like a serpent. You know the reason that uh, we should be careful with drink and putting the bottle to our lips is the same reason that we would not want to handle a rattlesnake or kiss a cobra. Amen? Same reasons. Because destruction, death, sorrow is going to come from that. Pain. And he said in verse 33, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter strange things. So when a person is drunk, they see things different and they say things that are different. They're controlled by this. And they'll behold strange women. And they will utter perverse things. I'll tell you what, I detest and refuse being around a drunk. When I had became a Christian, and uh, we got out of the military and moved back uh, to Tennessee, I was there for, uh, for eight, or, eight or ten years and uh, in construction work. And I still had relatives and folks around there that drank. I would not allow them in 
my home or on my property. I, I refuse to be around. Someone is drunk. You can't talk with them. You can't reason with them. There's nothing you can do with them. And they are going to be speaking perverse things. They're going to be doing it. He goes on to say in verse 34, Yea, and thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. In other words, they drowned in their own booze many times. Or it says here, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. That is swaying back and forth like a, the mast upon on a ship. And, you know, just drunk, can't walk, can't talk. And it says in verse 35, and they have stricken me. This is the drunk. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. And they have beaten me, and I felt it not. And notice the latter part of this. And when shall I wake? He says, I will seek it yet again. Old drunk man, he get over it. He's got a hangover and a headache, and he can't hardly stand it. He's taking everything he's getting his hands on. I'll never drink another drop in two days, three days, a week later. He's right back at it again. He's right back at it again. The addiction is there. Well, notice in Proverbs chapter 31. In Proverbs chapter 31. Now, I want to read some verses and show you some people who are definitely to leave it alone. And the first one is kings. Those who have to have a clear mind and make clear judgment, they're to leave it alone. And what we're going to be reading here is actually written by a mother. <laughs> and written by a mother. And I'll tell you someone else is to leave it alone as well, and that's a priest. A priest, a minister, Leviticus 10, 9, and Ezekiel 44, verse 21. Uh, he told them as they enter in and doing the work of the Lord and the temple, the tabernacle, that they're not to touch it. I'll tell you somebody else that wasn't supposed to touch it. Those that made a vow to the Lord, the Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter 6 and verse 3, not allowed to touch it. And then in First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3, a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, an elder is not to touch it. We're not to allow our minds to ever be distorted in any way. And I believe that every Christian should think about that. Every Christian. Notice he says here, I'm reading in chapter 31. By the way, let me give you a few other verses before I read here. Daniel 5, beginning in verse 3 through verse 30, Belshazzar. You remember they get having a feast, a party. You know, we talk about revelings, banquetings, and things. And the in in the first century, the Roman and Greek feast and so forth, basically drunkenness and and all those kind of things, carousing and so forth. Well, Belshazzar and his his um, staff and all the people around him, they began drinking. Uh, the wine and getting drunk. And they even took the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had brought from the temple of God and they began drinking out of those. And that's when you have the handwriting on the wall. And that night, the king's life was taken. And Habakkuk chapter 2, and in verse 15, Woe unto those who take the bottle and put it to their neighbor's mouth. In other words, trying to entice Others to drink. That is wrong. Hosea chapter 4 verse 11. Uh, it takes away the heart of an individual. They can't think. They can't operate properly. And by the way, there are others that abstained Israel in Deuteronomy 29 verse 5 and 6. They abstained for 40 years from wine in the wilderness. They couldn't grow any out there. And you couldn't send off to the package store. Well, notice with me. As we come here, we find in chapter 30, I'm going to begin chapter 31 rather, reading from verse 1, he said, the words of King Lemuel, that word means uh, devoted to God, referring to Solomon, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son, what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. 
let they drink and forget, lest they drink rather and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And we know that this is true. And those who drink, uh, again, and many politicians, many leaders, uh, drink today, and I believe it distorts their judgment. I don't want to believe it, but statistics 10 and 15 years ago was showing about 40% of clergy drinks also. Drinks, drunkenness. But he said in verse 6, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, those that are dying. And he says, And wine of those that be of a heavy heart, hearts, and let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. In other words, give it to those that are perishing, those that are dying. We know even today that in the hospital they try to make people as comfortable as possible and things of that nature. They get some type of drug or whatever because of the pain in the process of their dying. Well, notice now as we come to the New Testament, and notice with me in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 5, first of all. We read in this text uh, this morning, looking at a different subject, but I want to read verse 11 through 13. Verse 11 through 13 in 1 Corinthians 5. Again, Luke 1, 15, John the Baptist, he abstained from birth throughout his life. Jesus gave warning about drunkenness in Luke 12, verse 45, in Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 38, and in Matthew 24, verse 36 through 46. The Lord Jesus Himself gave warning about drunkenness and His coming and so forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 11. He said, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard. So there's our word again. He said, Or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. So you're not to even uh, be a friend and spend a lot of time with someone who is going to be a drunk. And, of course, I won't read the next two verses. We used those this morning in showing the issue of church discipline. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. We find here that it will keep a person from heaven, as we saw in Galatians 5, 21. Verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. There's our word again. He says that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who live a life of drunkenness. I've seen people live a life of drunkenness or drugs and they die in that condition and I've watched preachers preach them into heaven. According to this text, a drunkard, the drug addict, if that's their lifestyle, that's the way they're living, uh, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God, as well as these other sins that are listed here. Notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. Notice here. When I was 12 and 13 years of age, I had an uncle that would go, and now this, this is sad, but I've heard other stories throughout my life, but I had an uncle when I was 12, 13, 14, and 15 years of age, I had an uncle that he had several children, but he would go and buy beer and whiskey for me and his sons and take us anywhere we wanted to go to drink it. I thought, how sad. You know, after I got grown, well, I thought it was a fantastic thing at the time, but I got grown and realized your own relatives your own relatives. Not they only drank it, but they promoted it. I mean, take his own son. And my uncle, take his own son, he had to, especially the one in particular, and us very, very young, and go buy it for us and take us wherever we wanted to go and put us out. Notice with me in First uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5. 
I'm reading from I'm reading from verse five. He says here, Ye are the all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for the hel- for an helmet the hope of salvation. We see again drunkenness associated with the night here and the Christian We're children of light. We're children of the day. And so there's to be a vast difference between the two. Well, let's close in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I want to read one verse in closing. Now, let me give you about four reasons why that um, I think that we should not drink. Again, I could not just tell you positively you can't touch it, but I can give you some reasons why that it would probably be the best. One is the passage we read in Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, is to avoid the temptation of drunkenness. You see, most that are addicted to alcohol or drugs most will not admit that they've got a drinking problem. They will not admit it. And then the question is, how much is too much? You ever thought about that? You know, most would not sit down in the evening and take a glass, a small glass of wine and drink that and that's it. Most would not do that. Well, how much is too much? If I abstain from it, I don't have to worry about the temptation of drunkenness. Another reason is in Romans 14, verse 21. I'm not asking you to turn to these. But uh, another reason is, is to avoid causing a brother to stumble. And that passage actually says, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. That's a good reason for me. It may not be for you, but it is for me. Another reason is in 1 Thessalonians 5.22 is to abstain from all appearances of evil. When I look at the, when I look at the alcohol industry today, and the advertisements and promotions and where it's usually sold and things of that nature. Uh, I, I just rather would stay away from that. And, and, I mean, we find, we find it abused in bar rooms and dances and, and clubs and parties and things of that nature. And I just, I, I just want to abstain from the appearance of evil. That's another, the third reason. And the fourth reason would be in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16, where he tells us to be sober-minded. And the fourth reason is to avoid impaired judgment. Impaired judgment. To be sober-minded. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want to take one verse from this chapter, and that's verse 23. By the way, I've been very happy the last 47 years because I'm drinking of the water of life freely. And it's satisfying. It's much more satisfying than the liquor and the wine. You know, when I grew up, you could leave in any direction from my house. I just... Think about the availability today. It's everywhere. You buy it everywhere. Convenience stores and Walmarts and uh, Costco's, I guess, and all the places you go. But when I grew up, you know, you could, you could take a left from my house or a right and almost walk to whiskey steels and get white lightning. They still had the steels. Yeah, they were trying to stop it, but they still had the steels and so forth then. Well, notice with me, as we come here to this text. That's why I want to preach a message 
on drugs and especially marijuana, I can understand them doing research to use marijuana medically, but it always gets abused as alcohol. Alcohol has been used medically. Uh, even in your NyQuil, you'll probably find some alcohol in it. And growing up, they kept some whiskey around for colds. They'd mix it with uh, honey and mix it with orange juice or something like that. And it would cut a cold. I don't keep it around now. I told you why. I keep it away. But, uh, but with marijuana and other drugs, especially marijuana, it's becoming legalized in many states. California, Washington, Oregon, places like that. And I guess that's no worse than Alabama having their own liquor stores. I mean, when you really think about it, Alabama has their own liquor stores. Liquor is killing as many people or more than, you know, drugs. So I guess it's really no difference. And I can understand the research on this and, you know, uh, as you would alcohol. But... It will, it's already being abused. And it will destroy a person's life just like alcohol if they take enough of it. Think all oh, the marijuana is fine. It will destroy memory. If you smoke it, it will destroy the lungs. It will it'll, it'll affect some of the vital organs. And, and, uh, and they're just, I mean, people are just crazy about this. And it being legalized. You can go in shops in some states and buy it, just like you could go in the liquor store and buy liquor here in Alabama. And it's going to be abused, and especially by young people. Especially by young people. We find here in verse 23, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said in Drink no longer water, that is water only, but use, notice how it's worded, but use a little. How many see that? Now some of the brethren say, well, this is not alcoholic wine. I doubt if this is referring to grape juice. I doubt if John 2 is referring to grape juice at Jesus' first miracle at a wedding, I doubt that. But he says, Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. It's used here medicinally. It's used here to help heal something. And when it is abused, it will destroy the stomach. He said, Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmity, infirmity really. Would you stand with me tonight? I just try to be honest with the Scripture. And we do see uses of wine throughout the Word of God. And again, I address that in half of my sermon in 2010. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee tonight for Thy Word, for Thy truth. And Lord, help us to have it correct. That we would believe the right things. And Lord, that we would walk in the things that we do know to be true. And Lord, we come here tonight before Thee and we ask Your blessings upon the remaining of this service, upon the hymn and upon the prayer request that will be lifted up, and we just pray for Thy presence, for it's in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.